Chapter 2 Nearly three decades later, White Boy Rick remains an iconic figure in his hometown, an enduring symbol of the height of the cocaine era. Detroiters still tell stories about his 80s heyday, and some of them are true. Rick Worshey really did drive a white jeep with the words, The Snowman, emblazoned on the rear, though he had no driver's license. He wore track suits and chains, mink coats, a belt made of gold, a Rolex encircled with diamonds. When another drug kingpin landed in jail, Worshey swooped in and took up with the guy's wife, a sought-after ghetto princess, as one federal agent put it. In 1987, when Worshey appeared in court on charges of possessing multiple kilos of cocaine, the judge remarked that he looked like the killer Babyface Nelson. But as far as this court is concerned, she went on, he's worse than a mass murderer. In Back from the Dead, Detroit native son Kid Rock rapped, One bad bitch I smoke hash from a stick, got more cash than fucking white boy Rick. I first happened upon White Boy Rick's story last year and quickly became fascinated enough to call some of the police officers and federal agents who had figured in it in one way or another. With some surprise, I discovered that while most of them remembered the story in detail, few of them had any idea what had happened to Worshi since the Reagan administration. It was as if the legend of White Boy Rick had swallowed the real person at its center. Except he wasn't gone. I had first learned this from a column about incarceration policy published last year on The Fix, a site covering drugs and addiction. The author reported that Worshi was, in fact, more or less where people had last seen him in the late 1980s, sitting in a prison cell somewhere in Michigan. This made Worshi not only a local icon, but also an anomaly and something of a mystery in the world of criminal justice. In May 1987, when he was 17, Worshi was charged with possession with intent to deliver eight kilos of cocaine, which police had found stashed near his house following a traffic stop. He had the misfortune of being convicted and sentenced under one of the harshest drug statutes ever conceived in the United States, Michigan's so-called 650 Lifer Law, a 1978 act that mandated an automatic prison term of life without parole for the possession of 650 grams or more of cocaine. The average time served for murder in state prisons in the 1980s was less than 10 years. Sentencing juvenile offenders to life without parole for non-homicide crimes was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2010, by which point such sentences were already exceedingly rare. The court was able to locate only 129 inmates serving them nationwide. Michigan eventually acknowledged the failures of the 650 Lifer statute. The governor who signed it into law, William G. Milliken, has called it the greatest mistake of his career, and rolled it back in 1998. Those already serving time became parole eligible and began to be released. Worshi is the only person sentenced under the old law who is still in prison for a crime committed as a juvenile. Prominent and violent kingpins and enforcers from Worshi's day in Detroit have long since been freed, and yet Worshi has remained incarcerated for more than 26 years. The Fix column, written by a prison activist who is himself serving a lengthy sentence for drug trafficking, quoted some of Worshi's own explanations for his fate. He had been an informant for the FBI, he claimed, and his handlers had pushed him into the drug trade to serve their own ends. He had later run afoul of the local police by helping the FBI expose corrupt cops. The FBI and police lied about this for more than two decades, Worshi said. I just want the truth to finally come out. Worshi's claims seemed implausible, if not fantastical. But one detail near the end of the article caught my eye. A quote from a retired FBI agent named Greg Schwartz. The events surrounding the incarceration of Richard Worshi, Schwartz said, are a classic example of abuse of power and political corruption. A former federal agent was backing the cause of the notorious white boy Rick. I decided to try to get in touch with Worshi. His attorney's office helped set up a phone conversation, 
and where she soon called from a payphone in a prison in a remote corner of Michigan. He was polite and well-spoken. His voice occasionally rose as he tried to get across his version of events, but he did not fixate on portraying himself as a victim. He mentioned that he'd recently read Mark Benelli's Detroit City is the Place to Be, an excellent account of the recent history of the city published two years ago. Wershe told me he found it sad and enlightening. It struck me that Wershe was learning about the downfall of his hometown from a book. Detroit still talks about him, but he has not walked the city's streets since 1988. Wershe and I have spoken dozens of times since. I have also talked to everyone I could find who knew something about Wershe's case. Detroit police officers, investigators from several federal agencies, former Detroit drug kingpins who shared the streets with him, Warshi's family and friends, lawyers, state and federal prosecutors, and parole board members. Over time, claims that at first I deeply doubted proved to be true. Accounts that seemed reliable were convincingly contradicted. For months, the central mystery only deepened. Why was Wershe still in prison? By the time I thought I knew the answer, I had come to understand how much the reality of Rick Wershe deviated from the legend of White Boy Rick. <laughs>